Check, check.
I think it's working. Okay. They say it's working. I'll just sit in for a little bit. Okay. Something goes wrong. I'll Thank you. Yeah. I was not expecting all of this. <laughs> Hi. Oh, you're going to want more. <laughs> uh, I love nerds. <laughs> You want some more? <laughs> <laughs> how, how was your flight here? It was lovely. I was just telling Stephanie that I was surprised by how small the airport is here and that it was closed at 7 p.m. <laughs> so very thankful for whoever was working because it was empty. And then I found out that there's only one flight that comes in and out. <laughs> so oh. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Are you a student here? I'm actually part of a community here. I just turned in my, my graduate application here, though. <gasps> we'll see if I get in for next year. Congratulations. I hope you do. What are you hoping to study? I want to do library and science. Yeah. So I really want to work with communities, <laughs> especially small communities in Mexico. Yeah. Because, like, in, like, for example, my village, like, our map of the Hacienda before, when the Spanish rulers were still there, like, oh, that yeah. map, the original territory, is all the way in Mexico City. So I'm like, how do I bring those maps to, villi to villages like mine? Mm -hmm. so, like, their history. So that's what I want to do. That's what I, want I to love do. that. And public libraries are important in general for community building. Yeah. <laughs> so, my fingers are crossed for you. One of them. I can't do the other one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah you know. Also, your name is really. Oh, my name's Caitlin. Caitlin, yeah. nice to meet you. Yeah. I went to your talk for Indigenous feminism. Oh, online? Yeah. Oh, yay! I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, I like. It. <laughs> it was cool. I learned a lot. Yay! Yes. I wish there was a lot more discussion, but I think people just came there to learn instead yeah. of discussing, and I was like, yeah. which is fine. Yes. I hope you enjoyed the readings. Yeah. Aww. I downloaded this so I could like reread them in Mexico because I'm actually getting to like to Mexico, but so. Oh, okay then. Are you going to the small airport? No, I'm going to Oh, so you're just gonna drive there? Yeah. Okay. And then what I'll do is I'll introduce you by reading your I'm bio and then so, like, you can take it away. Oh, wonderful. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Where can I sit? <laughs> okay. What would be best for me to sit? I'll sit here. Sit instead. So <laughs> <laughs> 
I did it already. Sorry. <laughs> I saw you didn't know. I was like, oh, maybe that's the problem. I'm safe. Okay, exactly. yeah. yeah. I'll say it right here. Now. Okay, thank you, Dave. Okay. So, Dave, sure. get it back to the if anything tech goes wrong. Well, we'll take care. Of it. Wonderful. Thank I'm you. I'm going to go down to my office, which is just down the hall. Okay. I wish you all good things and a great presentation. So, uh, it was a pleasure to meet you. Yeah. Yes. Take care. <clears throat> Yeah, 
Yeah, thank you. You need to borrow this one. <laughs> Is your name also your name is Dave? Yes. <laughs> That's a common name, David. <laughs> it is such a common name. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Do you want to have a handheld that might be better for this? Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll be right back. This is where Stephanie and Heather uh, presented. So they kicked out, kicked us off over here. And then Karen and Johnny presented at the end. We're here, so try to spread you. <laughs> okay. Why aren't you working? Is it because of this? Oh, maybe you switch off and then switch that on. I have no idea how to turn it off. Oh, check. Is check check. Hey, can you go here at the room? Room? No. So the people on Zoom and the mm -hmm. like live stream can hear. So it's yeah. on. You have the, the brain box too. We can take it off. Oh, there it is. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Check, check. Hey. There we go. Hello, hello. Right now. Okay. Test, test. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Charlotte Davidson. I am Diné and a citizen of the Mandan Hadatsa Narikara Nation. I serve as the director of the Native American House. 
It is my distinct honor to introduce our special guest today. A Diné scholar born and raised within the Navajo Nation, Charlie Scott, they, her, is dedicated to inspiring joy and justice. Their scholarship and writings are imbued with a desire for a more just and liberating education that supports and cultivates the next generation of queer, trans, and indigenous brilliance. In addition, Charlie reflects, analyzes, and celebrates what it means to be Diné, queer, and trans in the 21st century on her personal blog, DineAesthetics.com, and celebrates her entirety on Instagram and TikTok at Diné Aesthetics. Please help me welcome Charlie. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Hopefully this doesn't make any sound, but um, it did make a sound. <laughs> I did. That's my fault. <laughs> Hopefully it does not happen, um, but it is an honor to be here. And I would like to thank Dr. Charlotte Davidson for inviting me here today to continue the Native Parish programming happening here at this university. So before I begin, because I'm here to talk about the chapter five in the spirit of relation and kinship, supporting two-spirit and LGBTQ plus relatives. Um, and I want to share with you two things, the opening statement from the chapter um, and a letter that was included and written by my co-author of this chapter, Preston, a two-spirit Cree and Mexican poet, advocate, and friend, um, to help us frame this conversation, our time together, and possibly a Q&A later. Um, so the opening statement, this is not on. I was wondering why this wasn't going. More tech difficulties. <laughs> You're fine. It's not. Right back. Oh, well, I'm going to go stand at the podium then. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it is two slides down. So this is the chapter from this book. And then this is the opening statement. This chapter was written with courage and love for nation, institutions, communities, and people that neglect and deny us of our humanity. We imagine and are working towards a world that supports and celebrates the beauty, the strength, and the brilliance of our indigenous two-spirit and LGBTQ plus values. Thank you. And this letter from Preston, which I'm not going to put on the slides, you're going to have to listen to me. <laughs> Dear Two Spirit, Indigenous Queer, Non Binary, and LGBTQ plus kin, know that we belong. I want you to know that we belong in the spaces that our spirit pulls us to. Our roles and responsibilities existed and continue to exist. You are fulfilling them by carrying the creation stories and understandings that some of our nations seem to have forgotten. Your existence is a resistance to colonization. Do not let people tell you which side you should sit on when they do not yet understand that you sit where you are needed. Do not let people tell you where you belong when they do not yet understand what it means to be chosen to carry the weight of your nation, even when they don't always carry you. Do not let people tell you what it means to be traditional 
when they do not yet understand your place in the community because they are still not fulfilling theirs. When they tell you to pick a side, pick the middle. When they tell you we don't belong, pick your prayer. When they tell you that two-spirit is not traditional, pick your spirit. There will be so much joy in your life when you start to choose yourself. You are not being rude or selfish when you do this. You are not alone during this time either, though it would feel likely feel lonely. You are never alone when your bones hold stories, your blood holds memory, and your prayer holds hands with your ancestors. So hold hands with them by choosing you. Let the boundaries you make shield your spirit from the legacies of these empires. Pick yourself until you are able to pick up and sift through the pieces of colonization. Center your healing until you are a center of healing. I wish people could see what the creator has selected you for without having to go through the emotional labor, the bartering of personal value, the compromise of safety. I am hopeful that current understandings around gender diversity will catch up in the same way we see scientific knowledge attempting to catch up with indigenous knowledge. Though I want to remind those who may be waiting for external validation from worldviews that are not ours, that we do not need the outside world to understand us in order to be valid, loved, welcome, safe and supportive. If there is anything I would want my two-spirit, indigiqueer, non-binary, LGBTQ plus kin to carry forward, it would be that you deserve peace and kindness, love and happiness, to not only exist, but to thrive in a light you carry so deeply inside. Let it shine. That it's a letter written by my friend, Preston. Um, I cannot say their last name, um, which is why I just call them by Preston. But you can follow their words and brilliance on Instagram at Preston Manifesto. So who am I? <laughs> um, Dr. Charlotte Davison did share the bio that I have. Um, so my name is Kelly Amaya Scott. My English pronouns are they, them, and she, hers. I was born and raised in the heart of my homelands near the canyon that protected my ancestors from Spanish conquistadors and later the U.S. military. I'm a fifth-year doctoral candidate at the University of Denver, which, just like this university, um, occupies and contributes to the colonization of indigenous peoples, specifically University of Denver. It's the Cheyenne Arapaho in Ute. I sort of explain to people that I study the intricate and intimate relationships between settler colonialism and colleges and universities intended on understanding how indigenous peoples, particularly my mother, the first in her family to ever graduate, refuse systems of colonial violence and navigate the collegiate atmosphere. Outside of my own academic career, I spend way too much time on social media, um, creating videos that I think imbue, are imbued with joy and a hope really to inspire justice. And before I continue further, as you can see, this is a very long introduction and I haven't even got to the topic. Um, I want to give my own rent acknowledgement because I find that acknowledgements to be reminders that we have a responsibility to reflect on our own participation, our own contribution, and our own involvement with slash in settler colonialism. And so it's really imperative that we consider and act ways to support the resilience and refusal that so many indigenous communities, local and globally, have inherited and are continuing. And I am saying this as we continue to witness a rise in colonial, imperial, and nation state violence occurring against those in Sudan, in Haiti, in Congo, in Palestine, 
and so many other places across the world. Because Land Back really is a global call for the return of Indigenous land and our existence as Indigenous peoples. And so thank you for listening, hopefully with more than just your ears, but also with your heart. So I am here to talk to you about a chapter I wrote for Developments Beyond the Asterisk. Yet I also would like to mention the significance of this book and its predecessor. Because Beyond the Asterisk, which is the book on the right, came out in 2013. And which is about 10 years ago. 10 years ago, um, I just graduated from high school. And this book became a lifeline for me when I started my master's program in 2017. And so in my chapter, I mentioned how revolutionary Beyond the Asterisk was, given, and from what I can recall, this is the first edited collection of indigenous scholars illuminating a plethora of issues that impact the experiences of indigenous students, faculty, and staff in higher education. And it truly is an honor that there's actually two authors here from Beyond the Asterisk, Dr. Charlotte Davidson, and Dr. Karen Francis Begay. Um, and I probably should have brought my copy to show you the different highlights, the different notes and sticky tabs that I have literally inserted to showcase how important that book was to me. Um, and about 10 years later, we have this beautiful book, Developments Beyond Asterisk, and it was an extreme honor to be invited to contribute a chapter especially a chapter that centers our two-spirit and LGBTQ plus relatives. This was not included in the first book and there was very little mention of how our two-spirit and LGBTQ plus relatives navigate higher education. And so for this next rendition, it was really important for the editors to include a chapter such as that. Um, and something that I do want to celebrate is that this is probably the first time that a book chapter, particularly within the field of education, is about our two-spirit and LGBTQ plus relatives, and that was written by myself, an Indigenous trans femme, and my co-author, a two-spirit relative. And I'm very hopeful that it will not be the last, um, and I'm very proud to be such, be part of such a legacy. So now, we'll get into the chapter, which I'm sure is why most of you are here. Um, so this is gonna be the pathway of this sort of conversation. I will share with you this sort of, what exactly do I mean by the cis hetero establishment and its connection to education. I'm going to share a very brief um, moment of the reemergence of our two-spirit relatives. I'm going to provide an overview of the spirit of relation and kinship, and then end with some guidance and calls to action, as most of you are in your own way going to become leaders of your field. And so, the cis hetero establishment. So you can probably already know that I spend way too much time reading books. Um, I study education, I'm a PhD candidate. We spend most of our lives stressed about reading. Um, but I specifically study colleges and universities, which is a very niche field in and of itself. But whenever I talk about the gender, colonial gender binary and settler sexuality, or specifically the establishment of a cis heteronormative, white supremacist, patriarchal imperial system, I don't know the exact framing that Bell Hooks um, uses, but I often return to this area of American Indian boarding schools. How many of you in this room have an idea of what American Indian boarding schools were? Feel free to raise your hand if you want. Okay, so like a good, good half of you. Um, and it's really fun if you don't, no pressure. Um, because what I usually do is I tell people that it was really during this era um, within our educational system that the U.S. empire was really deeply committed to the indoctrination of indigenous peoples into their society and the elimination of what it means to be indigenous. And there is practically photographic evidence of this. Um, one of the most famous photos that I believe 
represents this indoctrination is a Tom Carlino, another Diné. Um, so you see in this photo, Tom was photographed before and after attending the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. In the second photo, Tom's hair was cut in the style of what was considered civilized and appropriate for a young man. And then his clothes of his ancestors were removed, probably burned, and were replaced with a suit and tie. And interestingly, when I shared this photo at a conference of health professionals, they actually were asking about like, why is it that Tom in the first photo is darker and then in the second photo, he's lighter. And so you see there's a sort of slight editing happening here of like darker meaning fat associated with different indigenous symbols and artifacts. And the more lighter and wider you are is a lot more acceptable. acceptable. So you see the sort of like colorism happening within photographs, which is, intriguing if you know about the history of photography, since photography was sort of created and developed to make white people look better than black people. Um, and so in my opinion, this photograph has really become a, a symbol that assimilation was possible and achievable. And yet for myself and many other indigenous peoples, this image became a symbol of something else entirely the expansion of settler colonialism and the establishment of a cis heteronormative system. Because you see the death of disappearances of indigenous presence really allowed the fruition of settler sexuality, which is a reference to Scott Laurie Morgison, a non-native scholar who did a lot of great work around um, gender and sexuality and the rise of the colonial gender binary. And I say the colonial gender binary because how we understand what it means to be a man and a woman is really rooted in this sort of history of colonization. And so the gender and sexuality of indigenous peoples were considered savage, considered primitive. And you can see this with a sort of like allure, the sort of witnessing of intrigue from this image, which I believe is created by Kent Mockman, who is a First Nations um, artist. And you see like how there's like this native man, sort of like that very representation of like a sexualized native man in the center. And you see like a bunch of politicians in awe of this person. Um, Kent Mockman does a really good work of really tackling settler colonization obsession with native sexuality. Um, but the reason why American Indian boarding schools in particular, the photograph of Tom Carlino is not only a photograph of a change in hairstyle and aesthetics, but rather is also a photograph of the elimination of indigenous ways of being that existed beyond the colonial gender binary and before settler sexuality. One could say a pre cis heteronormative society. And I'm really, in the book chapter, we go into this a lot more detail, and this is just an overview and summary. But the reason why I want to start with this is because you begin, you, you sort of are sort of forced to bear witness to what has happened, but also be reminded that despite the centuries of violence, my people are still here. I mean, I'm sitting in front of you at what I just first called was a top 10 university, um, and one of the most well-known land-grant universities, particularly within the state of Illinois um, and across the U.S. empire. And being here, especially within the last 30 years, there has also been a reemergence of stories and memories of relatives who exist and defy their sexuality and gender and who do not constrain themselves for the comfort of colonizers. And that is something I also... Um, want to celebrate because the reemergence of our two-spirit relatives in particular is really a homecoming for our native nations, our tribes, and our indigenous communities. And it's a homecoming that I had the honor to celebrate within the book chapter. And I get to share with you a little bit about that. So where exactly did the phrase two-spirit come from? Well, as the story goes, is that during a 1990 summer gathering of indigenous peoples with diverse sexual and gender articulations, 
The phrase two-spirit was shared. It was told to Dr. Myra Laramie of the Fisher River Cree Nation in a dream. And she is many of us who sort of believe, articulate the early beginnings of what it means to be two-spirit and describe this existence to many at the gathering. And I do want to caution that there's no specific definition of two-spirit, despite what many in academia might declare or even mainstream media or even your favorite indigenous queer TikToker um, or influencer. <laughs> and I would argue that two-spirit is really meant to be a movement, communicating, describing existential possibilities that were silent because of colonization. And if I were to give a definition, what I would share is that when you declare yourself as two-spirit, you're really acknowledging and honoring the political, the cultural, and the historical obligations and responsibilities that were and are unique to those who are two-spirit. I also do want to emphasize that to be two-spirit is very unique for Indigenous communities, particularly in the U.S. empire and what is now known as Canada, because of where the birthplace occur, because it came from a gathering of Indigenous peoples within this northern region, it would be very difficult and a bit of harmful to say that like, oh, you just have to be Indigenous and queer to be Two-Spirit. That is actually not true because not every Two-Spirit person identifies or aligns themselves with the LGBTQ plus community. And not every Indigenous LGBTQ plus relative is Two-Spirit. Um, one example is actually myself. Um, I share in English that I am Indigenous queer trans femme. In my language, we have a specific articulation um, where I am acknowledging my role and responsibility within my community. And so these distinctions are very important because the way that gender and settler sexuality exists often restricts and constrains who we are as people and who we could be. I mean, just think about yourself for a moment. Like your entire life, you were told that you were a man or that you were a woman. And have you ever really reflected on what that means for you, especially when you start to add on different layers? You're an Indian man, you're a white woman, you're a white cis man, you're a white cis man from a high socioeconomic background. These particular experiences influence how you interact with the world and how you engage with it. And also that type of legacy really restricts who you are in many ways. And so you see, because of settler feminism, you start to see that there is a requirement for the disappearance and the elimination of indigenous peoples. And unfortunately, this was accomplished with the establishment of a cis heteronormative nation state because indigenous sexuality and bodies then became more regulated and controlled in ways that really reflected the colonial gender binary and settler sexuality, which you see with Tom Torlino's photo. And so with such an establishment, policies and practices manifested and targeted our two-spirit and LGBTQ plus relatives. For example, Unfortunately, marriage equality is not recognized on several nations. As much as I love tribal sovereignty, unfortunately, tribal sovereignty is the reason that the Navajo Nation does not recognize marriage which between people of the two genders or similar sexuality. Marriage on the Navajo Nation is only recognized between a man and a woman. And that has been a policy and law since 2005. And there are sort of like, advocacy and activism to change that. But until then, marriage quality is not recognized. In addition, anti-discrimination policies for gender identity and sexual orientation do not exist. And so you start to see that there's this additional layer of violence that exists on Native nations for our LGBTQ plus and two-spirit relatives. Um, but despite that additional layer, um, our two-spirit and LGBT plus values continue to be in defiance of the settler nation state. And that is something that we can celebrate and also learn from. I mean, look at these wonderful memes. And one of my favorite artists, um, Lo Butterfly, who is a two-spirit artist. Um, 
again, it's something to celebrate. So now we get into the overview of what I mean by the spirit of relation and kinship. First, I just want to thank each of you for coming into this room and sharing time and space with me. You did not have to, and if you were required, I'm very sorry. Um, that was not my doing. <laughs> but it does show that you are willing to listen, not only with your ears, but also with your hearts, because this is probably not your typical book chapter presentation. Um, and if it is, um, can we be friends? <laughs> but I'm hoping that what I'm sharing with you so far has offered you some insight and preparation for the guidance that I will share with you later. Um, because to really listen with your heart, to really embody the spirit of relation and kinship requires you to experience the world a little bit differently than what some of you may be used to. Because listening with your heart, and I say this a lot, is actually a reference to Joanne's Archibald story work. Um, she talks about the power and presence of storytelling and story working. And one of my favorite quotes from her is like, storytelling is more than just listening with your ears, but that's also listening with your heart because it really requires your intention and your entirety to be present there. And so with that, you have to sort of engage in what is typically known as the four R's, acts of respect, acts of relevancy, acts of reciprocity, and acts of responsibility. And I would even add one more R, acts of relationality. And before I go into this overview, I do want to caution that this is sort of like a theoretical emergence. So if you cite me in your paper, word of caution, <laughs> you better put personal communication dot 2023 um, with that citation. And so within the field of higher education and in most academic fields, there are little research and scholarship that center or are written by our two-spirit and LGBTQ plus relatives. Um, in their 1991 article, Kirkness and Barnhard stipulated and demanded that indigenous peoples deserve an education that respects them for who they are that is relevant to their view of the world, that offers reciprocity in their relationships with others, and that helps them exercise responsibility over their lives. This is a dream, this is a vision, this is a demand from Kurtness and Barnhart made practically 30 years ago. And so in the chapter, my co-author and I expanded upon this and offered the following through like a queer lens. Indigenous two-spirit and LGBTQ plus relatives deserve to be respected for who they are, are supported and celebrated in ways that are relevant to their view and experiences within this world, are offered reciprocity rooted in radical kinship and unconditional love, and are provided the capability to exercise responsibility over their lives and those that they care and love for. This is sort of a expansion of Kurtness and Barnhart's statement rooted in celebrating and supporting our LGBTQ plus and two-spirit relatives. And although they are general, what is required of you is to really bear witness to the lived experiences of our two-spirit trans and non-binary relatives. And if you are in education, that requires you to be a little bit more kind, a little bit more patient. Because our two-spirit and LGBTQ plus relatives deserve to just be affirmed, deserve to be supported, especially as we continue to witness the rise of violence and ignorance against them. I mean, Trans Day of Remembrance was on November 20th. And with that, over, if I remember correctly, over 600 of my trans siblings were killed, were murdered, were neglected. And it's a very difficult reality to have um, and to sort of hear. And so if you've noticed, 
I did not mention anything about relationality. And if you didn't, here's your moment. Um, when we talk about relationality, this sort of refers back to Jody Bird's articulation. So this is going to be a little bit more out there because the way that she imagines indigenous queer relationality, it's an embodiment of an imagination of everywhere and everything disrupting the nowhere and there's really nothing associated with the death and disappearance of indigenous bodies i told you that quote was out there and that requires like a whole semester to really digest that um and we're not going to do that here but i'm going to leave that with you that there's this sort of imagination there's a futurity there's this deep love for everything and everywhere. And there's a sort of connection, understanding that you yourself extend beyond the classroom, beyond the space. And I'm really hoping that these framings provide you with a shift on what it means to be in good relation and in kinship with our two-spirit and LGBTQ relatives in preparation for our guidance and calls to action. And if you're taking notes, this is your moment. If you have your phone, you can take a photo. Entirely up to you. So here are four things that you can do. Question the role of gender and sexuality in your life and in your community. Easy, right? Pretty much all you got to do is just reflect on what it means to be who you are. Seek out read and listen to the oral stories and memories of our relatives who exist beyond and before the colonial gender binary. A little abstract, but here's a hint. Read books by authors who you will probably never read. There are some amazing two-spirit authors like Joshua Whitehead, Billy Belcourt. Um, there are some amazing artists who are doing this work. And by intentionally seeking them out, by celebrating their artwork, what they share with us, that is really one way that you could really begin to reflect and support their brilliance. The third one is expand your understanding of settler colonialism, read literature and scholarship outside of your field or area of practice. So this book chapter, wow, that got really loud. <laughs> This book chapter actually cited literature outside academia. In the book chapter, there are references to poems, there are references to letters, there are references to fiction in particular, to sort of like dream what it means to be celebrated, to be supportive, but also to understand the issues and experiences of our two-spirit relatives. And so that was something that my co-author and I really wanted to do is like, how can we bring our relatives into this chapter? Because citations are political. Who you cite matters. Who you value matters. And who you privilege and center influences the type of literature and scholarship that you're going to produce. And the fourth one is really cultivate support and encourage the dreams and desires of our two-spirit and LGBTQ plus relatives. Little abstract, but think about it. All of you in this room have a dream. All of you in this room have a goal. Some of you want to bring maps back to your community through a library science degree. Some of you want to become teachers and educators. Some of you want to become journalists and writers with our Nobel Prize. Some of you want to be political organizers. You have dreams. You have desires. How are you supported by them? Where is that support for our two-spirit and LGBTQ plus relatives? And how can you cultivate it? Think about your sphere of influence and ability. Starting with that can do a lot of great work. And I say this because my co-author and I, as you read, started this chapter with an acknowledgement of love. Because we know what it's like 
to be denied and ostracized by our nations, our tribes, and our communities. I live home on the Navajo Nation with my mother because I'm writing my dissertation um, and rent is getting out of control. <laughs> but I'm in a rural community on the Navajo Nation. The first few months that I was there, I would be openly stared at, be openly confused. A lot of people would literally come up to my mother and be like, who is this? And like, why are they here? I was called slurs by some relatives that my mother completely kicked out. At one point, there is this old man in the parking lot who was like really confused with like, are you native? Because of the way I dress, because of the way I look, because who I am is not the typical person. And that's the ostracization that happens. And I know that my experience is not just one. There are many who have similar ones. Because the work that we do in many ways is thankless work as two spirit and LGBT plus people. But it's work that moves us because we hope that it encourages you to dream and strive for a world that supports and celebrates our beauty, our strength, and our brilliance. And I hope that you didn't fall asleep because I know that my voice can lull people to sleep. <laughs> I'm very sorry <laughs> about that. Um, just thank you for coming. And I think we have enough time for a Q&A, but I get it, and I hope this was wonderful. Your beautiful, lovely presentation. So, Charlie, I'll go ahead and accept questions from the audience. Yeah. Yes. Um, what like titles of books do you recommend that are like the nonfiction side or even poetry from like two spider LGBTQ authors? So the question was, what are some books, specifically nonfiction fiction, that I would recommend from Two-Spirit and LGBTQ plus relatives? Um, I love Joshua Whitehead. Um, they are a dear friend of mine. And Joshua Whitehead is has actually been the editor of, Settler, of several um, collections. One of them was, gosh... Uh, I can't remember, but it was an ontology of science fiction. That's all I can remember. But Joshua Whitehead. <laughs> Apology. Um, Billy Belcourt. Billy Ray Belcourt. B-I-L-L-Y hyphen Ray R-A-Y Belcourt B-E-L-C-O-U-R-T does amazing work around poetry. He's also, I think, an assistant professor in comparative literature. So he's writing some really great stuff. Um, and was a, and actually I think is the only native Rhodes scholar, or the first actually, um, to have that scholarship. So Billy Belcourt, Joshua Whitehead. Um, there's a book, oh gosh. Another book is Drowning in Fire. I can't remember the author's name. Um, so those three ones I could recommend for nonfiction and fiction. Any other questions? Yes. I think the name was Joy Bird. Jody Bird. Yes. And um, this was the one about imagination. Yes. Everything. If there's time, 
could you read that again? I think it's very good. Yeah, I can. So Jody Bird, J O D I E Bird, B Y R D. Um, so the quote, actually, it's a summary because I don't have the exact quote. <laughs> the quote is about indigenous queer relationality. And she discusses it as that which embodies an imagination of everywhere and everything, disrupting the nowhere and nothing associated with the death and disappearance of indigenous bodies. You're welcome. Yeah. Oh. Um, actually, it's from Dr. Yolanda williams Gallaty, who is the director of the Gender and Sexuality Resource Center on campus. And her question is, what was the name of your favorite artist? This is not working now. But the name of my favorite artist is Mo Butterfly. Um, Mo is this amazing two-spirit artist, and he creates these beautiful digital art and print of just two-spirit love, two-spirit brilliance. Like, he has artwork of, like, people dancing at powwows. He has artwork of people just in their room with their loved ones. It's, it's really just a reflection of the intimacy, particularly queer and two-spirit intimacy. Mo Butterfly, M-O-E Butterfly, B-U-T-T-E-R-F-L-Y. And you with the fabulous glasses. I actually have a clarification on Jody Bird. So I thought my question answered. I was like, yeah. I can't read it exactly. Yeah. I wish I put references because the was asking for citations. <laughs> yes, this is that. Yeah, wow, it's a very personal deep question. Um, so I grew up on a Navajo Nation. I did K through 12 in what is considered the largest public school, largest public school, largest public district to serve Native students. I hope that made sense. Um, it's called Chinle Unified School District. And I, growing up, had Navajo teachers. And because I grew up on a Navajo nation, I grew up with Navajo brilliance all around me. And so being Navajo, doing enough, was never, was, wasn't really an issue until I realized that I, um, Maybe a little bit different, <laughs> um, being queer and trans. That's, I think, where it felt like I wasn't enough. Because I think so many people accepted that there's only one particular way to be Navajo. And because there's this like really weird relationship that people have with reproduction, because Unfortunately, indigenous peoples within the U.S. empire are the only ones who have a sort of thing, what we call blood quantum. And so in order for you to be enrolled within a native, a federally recognized tribe in particular, you have to meet a certain requirement of blood. And the only people who, we're the only people who are classified like that, because when you classify blood quantum is usually reserved for animals. Um, and so, for example, what my blood quantum is, is I'm considered three-fourth Navajo, one-eighth um, Yavapai, one-eighth Hopi. And so that's like a weird faction that's happening with my identity there. Um, and I know that that type of that can cause an identity crisis for people. 
Um, but for me, it wasn't really an issue. But only until I until we became only only until queerness and transness came into the topic. But when it comes to traditions in particular, um, I grew up with a mix of Navajo and the Mormon Church, which is an interesting experience. <laughs> <laughs> if you know about um, the Latter-day Saints and their religious doctrine. Um, and if you don't, um, Latter-day Saints believe that the reason why natives are red is because they're considered the lost tribe of Israel and that they were turned red as a sin by God. Um, and so um, by us becoming baptized, we are being believed of sin. Um, so that's why LDS church members are very intent on converting indigenous peoples, not only with, um, particularly within the Americas, um, because of that general belief. Um, and so traditions, particularly. If you read the public versions of our traditional stories, there's this sort of thing that happens with them where they aren't as inclusive as they should be. Um, especially because there's mistranslations. The first collection of the creation story from Navajos was collected by a US military officer. And because of his own religious background, he took a lot of the savagery and the sexual undertones out of that first publication. And then another non-Navajo came back, translated them again and added some variations of sexuality into them, but they came from more of like a this gender binary. Um, for example, one story in particular is the way that the penis and the vagina were made by first woman. And in that story, Paul G. Zolbrod, who is the other non-native to rewrite our stories, writes about how when first woman made the vagina and the penis, she only made it where those two would be attracted to each other. And so in this narrative, it's like, oh, a relationship is only valuable between a man and a woman. Um, but then I rewrote that story, um, which is in a short opinion piece with Yes Magazine. Um, I can't remember. I think it's retelling the creation story, something like that. Um, but in my story, I talk about how I do take like some of these important elements of first woman creating the vagina and penis. But then I add in a layer of like, you know, there's this power of creation, this power of love. And so I took the lessons of that story and made it more inclusive towards our trans and intersex relatives. And so in many ways, what we as LGBTQ plus and two-spirit people have to do is we have to breathe new narratives, breathe new traditions that are more inclusive um, and take what we learned from our communities and just clear them a little bit. Um, so it's not that I don't feel Navajo enough. It's more of like, are people able to accept the parts of me that they were taught to hate? And I know there was another question of like, how did I do this? <laughs> Um, a lot of tears, um, a lot of crying to my mom, a lot of arguments, but it really is, um, it came a lot from community too. So finding your community, finding your friends, finding people who celebrate you, all of your wins is really important and what has really helped me come to this space. So having a community of two-spirit and LGBTQ plus friends was also another lifeline that I'm very proud to have. So thank you. And there's eight more minutes. We can also end early if you want to leave. <laughs> yes. Um, oh, listen, we could have all day talk about my mom. <laughs> Um, so yes, my mother, first in her family to have her bachelor's, the first to have her master's, um, but then she stopped <laughs> and she actually, 
she does she would be considered what and I feel be a an adult um student. So she didn't finish her bachelor's until she was twenty eight. She had me at twenty. So between turning twenty and twenty eight, she somewhat went to school part time. And then at the age of 30, that's when she got her master's also when I was 10. So my mom had like two children she was raising. And then she also had all of my cousins because my mother is considered the responsible one in the family. <laughs> um, but growing up, she always encouraged me that education was a pathway for success because for her, it was the pathway was for her in many ways a pathway to get out of poverty. And so she sort of like instilled that belief for me, but I changed it to where like education, um, there's this really great quote by Bell Hooks that I love. In theory, I found healing. And in many ways, that's what education has been for me, has been a space of healing, a space to learn and grow with other people. And so that's sort of like the take that I get from my mother. Yeah. And behind me, yeah. yeah. So uh, forgive me if this question is too personal, but um, uh, have you had an experience where there was a friend or a relative of yours who at first was uh, had difficulty accepting you for who you were, and then that changed? And could you say anything about how that transformation occurred between you and them? So surprisingly, my mother. Um, so my mother accepted my queerness. She had difficulty though with my transness. Um, and the other person close to my life is actually my grandmother too. Um, and if we want to go a little bit further, I actually have not talked to my father for the past year because of just how homophobic he is. Um, but he doesn't know. But particularly when it came to my mother, we argued about my transness. She didn't understand why my, my English pronouns being they then was so important to me. And she didn't understand why I was changing my clothes. She, in many ways, what I've learned or found out is that she was just afraid. Her entire life, she was just afraid for what might happen to me and so she had these assumptions that being like a masculine this queer person would be a lot safer than being the feminine queer um, trans person and so for her it was all about optics and I'm also very thankful to have a brilliant sister um, who did a lot of the advocacy because there was one point where my mother and I did not talk um, but my sister was really working with her, was trying to make her understand. And so in many ways, having family and community who do understand, who do have and um, who are able to translate, um, really was why the relationship with my mother and I has been repaired. And she is actually doing that work with my grandmother, um, who, and there's actually, there's this really lovely video of my grandma that I posted on social media, where she called me beautiful. Um, because I was wearing a dress and I was wearing traditional moccasins that are often associated with Navajo women. And I was wearing a sash belt and it was like, a, it was for a photo shoot um, in our canyon. And so she actually has this photo and she just absolutely loves it because it's a photo of like my mom and I, and my mom is putting my hair up in a traditional hair bun. So my family has come, a, has come definitely a long way. Um, in the past decade. But in hindsight, it really is like, you need people to advocate for you. And so when you advocate for people who are different or, or people who have like less privilege or less access to resources, it really makes a lot of difference. So. Yeah. <laughs> so. The series of Native American Heritage Month related programs that the Native American House has been leading is all drawn from this book that Charlie had referenced, Development Beyond the 
to trips. Um, as Charlie mentioned, um, their chapter is one of the many um, chapters presented in the book. And in the spirit of reciprocity, um, on behalf of the Native American House, we want to gift you with this tote. It's um, <laughs> on the front is um, a Navajo squash blossom with the phrase walk in beauty. The walk in beauty is a phrase that we often utter as Diné people. We say hajona haslin. Um, and we utter it um, at the close of a lot of prayers. And so a lot of the, like our true vocation as Diné people is to restore order and balance and harmony in the world. And that is not an easy task um, at all, especially um, at non-native colleges and universities like ours. Um, so in it, we also have some items in here from you. Um, one in particular I wanted to draw attention to is a book of poems um, authored by Dr. Jenny Davis, who is Chickasaw. She is a director of American Indian Studies. Um, she's on sabbatical this year, um, but she really engages poetry to explore her and make meaning of her experiences um, at our university. So I hope you find a lot of knowledge um, and strength in this book. And so thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you to College of Education, Gender and Sexuality Resource Center for co-sponsoring our event. Thank you so much. And that matches my outfit. <laughs> <laughs>